If only they knew the hub for young business minds. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the If Only They Knew podcast. Today, I'm joined by Charles Burns, candidate on The Apprentice 20, 2017, businessman, founder of the Allergy app, and all round great guy. Charles, thank you for coming on. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's right. It's my pleasure. Um, if you don't mind, I'm thinking if we go back in time a bit and um, we'll get to The Apprentice and what you're up to a bit later on. But if we can go back to what life was like for you growing up, if you don't mind, get straight into yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the simplest way of putting it is I'm, I'm from a family of uh, entrepreneurs or business people, depending how you define it, uh, within the uh, retail jewellery sector uh, in Manchester and the surrounding areas. Yeah. Uh, so our, our main store is 125 years old, um, been in the family for about 60 odd years. Uh, in fact, last night, most Friday nights, we have a family dinner and my grandparents were around. So my grandfather founded the business and now my father runs it. I was involved with it from quite a young age as well. Um, but I think that's where it all started for me because around the dinner table, there would always be conversations about business, how the shop's doing, much to the uh, frustration of anyone that wasn't in the business or anyone else around the table. But I think that's where I got the bug. And then I'm very, um, I've got the very typical story of selling sweets on the school bus when I was 13. <laughs> yeah, um, standard, yeah, nice. Standard, standard <laughs> story. And then, you know, I was making £100 a week profit at that point, which is unbelievable when you're not spending money as well. Um, and then I just built up, built up a kind of a bit of cash. And then whenever there's an opportunity, like when the Live Strong bands, I'm not sure if you're old enough, young enough to remember even, um, but those kind of silicon bands that they had Live Strong had them and Nike had a, a kick it out racism campaign with them and they were super popular at the time. So I went and bought a load of those and then I was talking with China at age 14, 15 to buy more of these kind of uh, these silicon bands and that, that made me some money. And then the next thing that happened was a, an opportunity where one of my dad's suppliers, it was ice watches at the time. Um, and they're like a kind of fashion watch about the yeah, I've 50, got one 200 pound range. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And But at the time, Toy Watch was the, the leading brand. And this guy was just a, a representative for the business. And I think he was, you know, wasn't doing a great job or whatever. And he had these samples, about 200 watches. And he came to my dad and said, look, do you want to buy the samples? They're all working. Uh, and that, that's that. My dad's like, not really for me. I'm not sure. All the rest of it. I happened to have this money saved up and I thought, you know what, let's give it a go. So I bought the watches and sold them for a profit. And, and by the time I was probably 16, 17, I'd built about £20,000 uh, wow. in, in a bank account. And, and it, it was like, I, I equate the journey and, 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 and for want a better phrase, it's very cliched now, a bit like monkey bars, right? Where in the first, you put your hand on that first bar and whatever that might be. And then you try and catapult yourself with momentum to the next bar and you keep going and going. And I think that's the best way to kind of think of your story. Um, I think my favorite quote pretty much of all time is Steve Jobs. Um, well, his commencement speech for Stanford when he's addressing the graduates worth watching. Uh, it's about 15, 20 minutes on YouTube. And, and but the one thing that stands out to me, is he says that you can't connect the dots going forwards, only backwards. And it's absolutely true. Right. So true, I, can't, yeah. I, I can't um when I was age thirteen go, Oh, I know exactly why or how I got into the apprentice, but when you look at the kind of the various things that I've done, it kind of get, makes sense and adds up uh, and then work to where I am now. So that's what I always think about. Um as I say, you can't connect the dots going forward only backwards. It's just a great um, piece of advice. Yeah. So looking back then, um did you you seem to always always had that entrepreneurial flair, uh, if that's what you'd like to call it. Do sure. you think that's like a, a nature thing or do you think that's more of a nurture thing? Because you're surrounded by business minded people, it sounds like. So do you think yes. you got it from them or would you have had it naturally, do you think? I know it's a tough, tough one. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's an interesting, thought provoking question. Um, I think there's an element of um, you just born like that. I think if I, I look around, um, I'm trying to think as a, as a control group, my kind of close friends. Um, it's interesting actually if I think about it and I do think about this quite a lot actually most of them I'd say over 90% of my friends that were I was born and raised in Manchester as obviously they were um, they kind of flew the cuckoo's nest and went to London after university 
um, for the bright lights, bigger salaries and all the rest of it. And most of them are, are still there. Um, but when I look at what they're doing now, going back to your point, I think that the majority of them are in jobs in, in finance or well-paid roles. Whether they are passionate about it is a different story. But going back to your kind of nature nurture, I suppose most of those were, their families are not really business owners. They might be a dentist or something like that, which is a business owner, of course, but they're not like entrepreneurs and, and risk takers, I would say. Mm. Um, and maybe that does um, have an impact. But I think also something I th that's, not, that's interesting is if you look at from a, a religious point of view or from a, a migrant point of view, um, our families going back a few generations, we're, we're Jewish, so our families are migrants into this country, right? And when you find, I remember saying to my grandfather once, who was very successful in his own right, and he said, I said to him, why, why are people that are, you know, immigrants tend to be very successful? And he said, well, they have nothing to lose. And I think that's where it stems from. Um, well, that's an interesting it, point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. From the very first generation. And then you might heard the phrase rags to riches and back again in three generations. So what tends to happen is that first generation that comes in has the uh, desire to, to build a better life for themselves and maybe the second but then it kind of gets lost in communication because then your lifestyle you know the way you're being brought up is very different to how your parents are brought up so i think that 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 goes back to the nature point nurture point rather where i this is a really tough one i i think some things like the way you think is absolutely influenced by who you surround yourself with and i think if you surround yourself with the right people so it's not to say if you're from a certain background that you'll do well or won't do well because you can clearly see that of people that have done well in whatever capacity, whether you define that financially or otherwise, um, people do well from a whole cross-section of society. And I think at a certain point in time, it's easy to go and blame, oh, I was brought up this way, or oh, I didn't have these opportunities, all the rest of it. But realistically, particularly in the UK, anyone can start a business up for, I think it's £13 to start a limited company. We don't even need to be limited company, to be fair. Um, anybody can start a podcast like you're doing or, or that I've got, for example, Anyone can start doing these things. It's a matter of having the desire and passion to do it, I think. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. It's a hot, it's a tough one. I've been rambling a bit. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, so, no, that's fine. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess it's probably down to like the individual as well and how their outlook. Um, it, for me, I know that I've had to do like a lot of looking back, like you said, looking back on my story as well and working out how I got here, why I got here and working out how I can go on, uh, go on like further forward from yeah. that and sort of, strive to be a better person even if my journey before was terrible you can yeah. always sort of change it at any point um but just going back there you mentioned like your friends and the path that they were on did yeah. you you went down like quite uh despite your twenty thousand pounds earnings from like selling stuff in school etc yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you went down quite a, a standard path right you went to school did you go to college and then uni as well so like, what was that like so I'm fortunate, you might say, that academically um, I find things quite easy. Um, mm. So I, you know, not to bribe, it's even an idea. So I got uh, pretty much straight A stars for GCSEs, three wow. A's, A level, uh, deputy boy in my school, all those kind of like typical things. So it was like, you know, your family, and this again comes back to family a bit. My family, albeit had been business people, um, when I was kind of approaching university time, it was probably around the recession, give or take, if I'm not mistaken, I think. So I'm trying to think now, I'm 26, 27, 10 years ago. Yeah, it was probably just just kind of after the effects were kind of starting to hit other industries from 07, 08. Right, yeah. And I think that we were looking around as, as a family, like, oh, things are really tough, whatever. And my grandpa was like, look, you need to get a profession, you need to go, you're intelligent, go to university, whatever. So I kind of just went because it was, again, everyone did it. It was one of those kind of things. But I went to a different university than most because it suited my course. So I'm, I've never been one when I look back, going back to your other point, I've never been one to follow the herd at all. Um, and again, I know it sounds cliche, but I kind of, I go with what I think's right and I and I'd weigh things up. I don't just go down, oh, all my friends going to this university doing this course, therefore I'll do it. Which yeah, I think course, that, that yeah. herd mentality is, is, is terrible. And many people go down that route and then they find out 10, 20 years later, they're, mi they're miserable and they can't find purpose because they've just been following everyone else's ideas. Um, so I went to university, Birmingham, uh, did a joint degree of business and law. So both, you know, both degrees at the same that time. That must have been tough. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I didn't find it too difficult. It was just boring. And, and I, I just was like, <laughs> I, I genuinely had the idea. So I thought, well, professional wise, I could maybe be a commercial barrister where I'm exposed to business, but I'm also, you know, um, in law as well. And genuinely, I know it sounds really, um, I don't know what the word is for it, but it, just, it sounds a bit bizarre. But I thought to myself, do I want to be the guy being paid by someone else to do their work or do I want to be paying the people to do work for me? Um, mm. That's That kind of just resonated. And then I remember watching that Steve Jobs commencement speech from Stanford that I mentioned earlier and various other things. And I started selling uh, flyers to um, to nightclubs for them to promote their, their um, events, whatever. And I got that kind of little bit of a taste of business again. I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just not, you, you get, and, and you will understand this, I'm sure, like you get a gut instinct. And all gut instinct really is, when you look at it scientifically, is it's your brain and your body putting everything that you've kn- known beforehand together and going, nah, this isn't right for me. Um, <laughs> and and you, get, you get points in life where you know that and sometimes where you've got to kind of mute it because you've got to kind of grind through something. But at a certain point, Again, it's actually another Steve Jobs from the same speech, funnily enough, where he says, uh, if you look yourself in the mirror too many days in a row and you don't like what you see, you've got to make a change. And that just kind of resonates. And I was like, this is this is not what I want to be doing. Like, I'm absolutely hating this. I'm not one really for going out and drinking. So that cut that out. To start yeah, with. I'm the same. I'm the same here. Um, so that cuts, that cuts out. I, I'm not one for that you know, lifestyle slobbing around. And I know this is very generic, but this is what I've experienced. Um, <laughs> And I'm not one for just a couple hours a week lectures and the rest of the time, just what do you do and whatever. So I just kind of decided I'm, I'm done with this. I knew from the first day, funny enough, but it took my parents, at that time they were more influential on my life than they are now. Um, and it took, them, uh, it took me about probably two months to kind of finally just yeah, throw the towel in. And then I came back, um, started working in the family business. It was near Christmas. I was doing pretty well. But I said to myself, I don't want to go into the business from uh, just being the son of the owner uh, or grandson of the founder, whatever. Yeah. I want to, if I go into it, add some value and show that I've got skills beyond just, as I say, I'm a family member. So I looked around and Tesco's had a kind of uh, school leaver scheme, best way to describe it. So I went, went on to that. I started as a training manager for them. And then again, kind of after a while, got this gut feeling that this was not right for me. I looked to, I mean, I th- one thing to do obviously when I think, sorry, when you're in a career is look around at the people that are the your managers or the managed manager or senior, more senior. And this is you, a big point. Yeah, go on. Sorry, yeah, this is you, a massive point. No, sorry. If you don't see yourself in any of those positions, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Like, like that's that's the truth and i looked around at my manager and I looked around at the director of the, the area and i'm like nothing about them i don't like the attitudes and nothing about what i see excites me like it doesn't interest me so i'm like again i'm not in the right place but i'm kind of torn up at this point so i'm like hold on a minute i've gone to university that's not worked out i've gone to this thing which is a great opportunity there's only i think oh, i can't remember there was maybe 30 of us around the country out of a thousand applicants and I'm like, what's going on here? Like, what? I can't seem to find anything that's suitable. Am I just being, you know, whiny and, and a little brat, or is there something more serious here going on? And that, across my mind. Anyway, um, I got this is where kind of um, chance comes into things occasionally, where I was asked to go back to my old school and to present what an alternative routes university were. So I literally remember loading up the Tesco career page on my iPad. And it pulled up not only the store management program that I was on, but also this commercial development program. And I looked at that, I thought, that's, that's great. And it hadn't existed when I applied. And it was basically, you know, a position in their head office over in Wellington Garden City or Chesham down in London. And it was about, it was either being a buyer, which you can imagine what that is, or a merchandiser, which is all about making sure the right products are in the right place at the right time. Best way to describe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this is super interesting. I'd love to be a buyer at Tesco. That, sound, that sounds really interesting. So I then the next day after that kind of realization, I called my kind of money manager of the program. She's like, no, you can't, you can't transfer. This doesn't work like that. You've got to reapply. So I took a, I took a gamble. I was earning good money. I was living at home and say very pretty young. I was, I was pretty much banking up all my earnings. So I was earning you must have had money. loads of money at this point. Yeah, I was doing, I was doing, <laughs> pre, I was doing pretty well. Yeah, um, nice. So. But but I say I took this massive gamble that I my my boss hates me for it because 
it was a very, it's a, a small nuance, but effectively I wasn't on the payroll of the store. I was on like a special head office payroll. Right. And for that reason, the store brought in a thing called about time management because they, they were overworking their senior management. But I wasn't on a time clock. So I was basically being pushed from pillar to post. And they would say, oh, it's great for your development. Stay another day or do yeah, another of couple of hours. <laughs> I remember one time I got in at six. It was meant to finish about three. But then there was a, 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 a meeting. So my boss wanted to stay there. So I stayed for that. And then there was this thing called Rumble where you go around and you tied up the store. So by the time I finished, I worked for 12 hours. But I wasn't getting paid wow. hourly. I was paid on a salary. The only one in the store apart from the manager. So it got taken the piss out of quite a bit. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah. But then I said, I moved to, I, I, I said to my boss, here's what I'm doing. He hates me for it. And he put me on the graveyard shift, which is like, I think it was 1 p.m. to like 10 p.m. It was a horrible shift. Yeah. I <laughs> day. So I did that for a few weeks, took this gamble, did this whole process again, which is the exact same thing, and got onto the uh, scheme in London. And then they said to me, so I was doing at the time 17,500, I think, or 17,400 rings a bell. And so I thought, well, if I move to London, there's got to be a, a significant pay increase because I've now got to pay rent for all the rest of it and everything else. And they called me up and I'm obviously very excited. Like, oh, we love to have the opportunity. And I'm like, we're going to give you 18,000. And I'm, I remember thinking, my heart sank. I'm like, that is not workable. Like, um, but I was like, you know, as British people do, I didn't complain. I was like, oh, yeah, sounds great, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and I was then, I then took the view, which is maybe right, maybe wrong, that with the money that I'd earned over the previous years in school all the rest of it i told you about i thought i can use that to fund myself and it's almost like for at least a year or two it's like going to university but i'm funding my employment which is a really bizarre concept yeah, that is, but, yeah. <laughs> that's strange which is strange but that's the way I, I viewed it so i moved to london and then was a buyer within the music with the music so cds and i i like you was like do they even sell cds like who sells cds like <laughs> Um, anyway, so they do, and they sell about £70 million a year with the CDs. I probably wow. was buying about £30 million a year's worth. And this is, what I'm like, <laughs> this is like, I'm like 18, and I'm like, I'm making big decisions on, it was a fantastic opportunity, um, and really wow. interesting. Yeah, that's cool. So, w what age was this, roughly? Eight, did you say, like, uh, 18, 20, 18 yeah, 19, yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was, it was, the, the responsibility you got was madness. I mean, I, I remember the Brit Awards I've just been now, um, you know, on Facebook, it shows you like, you know, a highlight, a, a highlight from a couple of years ago. So about how many years ago it was, it's probably uh, six, seven years ago. I went to the Brit Awards, I was invited and that was really interesting. So there was tons of perks. I mean, I remember one time, a really two bizarre thing. So Cliff Richard um, recorded a video to Tesco to thank us for, you know, making him money, basically, uh, which is quite surreal. And then um, <laughs> I was introduced once to Jason Derulo. Um, wow. at Stamford Bridge but it wasn't like I was being I was being used to him because of my um, because of my position in, in the music industry so we, we could be I could work about 10% of all his UK music sales so it was really really surreal for him to be kind of wooing me rather than obviously normally the, the other way around so yeah, some, some a, inter very very interesting points yeah that's a mad situation to be in but what did that whole process teach you because obviously you suggested that you had wanted to be your own boss and you you got put in a uh, position with like such high responsibility where you almost yeah. had the same uh, uh responsibilities as a yeah. entrepreneur in a sense yeah. what did that whole process yeah. sort of teach you what did you get from it sure um so one of my old bosses told me that tesco is like an oil tanker it takes a few miles to turn around versus a, a startup that was like a speedboat um, so I'll give you an example how frustrating it, it, can, it, could, it can get in those sort of companies. Um, I was sat in an office of one of my smaller suppliers. So one of the interesting things I did find was that I had tremendous power, um, but I was also working with huge music companies like Universal Music and Sony, where like, like Beyonce and Jay-Z are kind of there, they're signed to. But then also much smaller companies where you know, they're, they're still doing go, okay by anyone's standards, a few million pound turnover, but they're not, you know, hundreds of millions or more. Um, mm. And so a decision that I made to these smaller companies could actually make or break their financial year. So I had the two things. I was one working with big, big companies and having to work more corporately and, and more officially, et cetera. But I also at the same time had this like affinity of to small businesses because I've been involved with them from very young where I could see that we can make a big impact on these people's actual lives. Whereas 
if I take a CD for Sony Music, realistically, it doesn't make a big difference to any, no, anyone. No, of course. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing. But I remember being sat in an office for a company called, I think it's called Union Square in Shepherd's Bush. And I'm sat there and I'm chatting to the guy. And I see behind him this really, really interesting, like, setup for, it's called an OFD, an off fixture display. And it was these tin cans, um, almost, imagine them, with CDs in them. And like, that's pretty novel. And Father's Day is coming up. I thought, that looked really cool. Something different. Like, we can offer our customers, all the rest of it. And it fit the kind of demographics. So I said to the guy, I said, Darren, I said, um, what's the deal with these? He said, oh, Charles, we've been trying for five years to get to Tesco's. There's no way. I said, what do you mean there's no way? Why can't we? Oh, the security concern. There's this thing. There's that thing. I said, Darren, send me uh, 30 of them to the office. And I'll see what I can do. So he sends me through to the office and we had a similar display and it was in the entertainment um, section of the, the the office. And I merchandised it with these things just to gauge a reaction of my boss and other people around and see what, what people were saying. And some people loved them, the music purists hated them and all the rest of it, sort of gimmicky. And then I kind of tried to push this and say, look, I want to take these in. And as I say, there were security concerns, there was this thing, there was that, it was unbelievable. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take the, the, the um, you know, take the thing about scruff of the neck. And I started with the connections I made previously, because I'm, I'm very, very um, keen on networking and the importance of it. I started with yeah. people that I knew within the business. So I'd email the head of security and the, all the different concerns. And I got it to a point where we could, we could go with it. It was no problem. And then my boss was like, well, I'm not quite sure. And then his boss was like, oh, I don't really like it. Anyway, I managed to force through the issue. And we put it in the store a week before Father's Day. And this is where not only we see the problem with large business, but of people in general. So everyone was against it. It ended very, very well. And we ended up getting another space for Father's Day. And I think it wow. brought in at least 100 grand plus of revenue, additionally to anything else. Damn, no so it's worth the risk. It was worth really, the really risk worth the risk. Nice. Yeah, but here's, here's, here's the kicker. So my boss's boss, who had pretty much um, told me it was a terrible idea and I'll just do it for whatever, we're sat in a meeting and he's then at his boss is there, the director. And he goes to her, oh, we've had this great week with these, um, with these CDs. And um, yeah, it was, it was my idea. And what do you think of it? And I'm sat there and I'm like, is this a joke? Like, I've not got any rec- <laughs> credit for it. Yeah. Guy, another guy's taking my credit and, and, and he's boasting about how great it is. I'm thinking, that's awful management. I remember the sinking feeling, but... At that time in your career, you don't feel like you can speak up and go, come on, that was mine. That that was completely me. There was no one else even involved or thought about this at that point. So, yeah, you learn, like, that's just one example, but you learn tons of things. You learn about um, over-promising. So, you know, people are promising to you, yes, you'll get a promotion if you just do X, Y, Z. You jump through the hoops, then the goalposts move and mm, the hiring yeah. freeze and there's this thing and there's that thing. Um so, yeah, it, it was a great learning curve, but it also taught me that I don't belong in large, large companies. Um, as much as I'd love to have run one at one point, and maybe I will one day. Um, and it might just be my experience with Tesco, but from other people that I hear, it's just that whole being a cog in a big machine um, that doesn't kind of resonate well with me. Well, luckily, a few years later, you then got out of Tesco, didn't you? And you appeared on probably one of the biggest business tv shows in the uk the apprentice yep. you was 24 when you applied right how, how did that sort of come about um certainly so the apprentice again if i look back at it and i've not really thought of my life like this until you kind of ask me to think about it but again it's another kind of chance chance thing where i was in my working for family business at the time and i went into the office uh, early morning and i don't know why i was waiting for a process on the computer to happen whatever it was and um, I just flicked through Facebook and it said last day to apply for The Apprentice. And I thought, I'll click on that. Interesting. I've always thought, you know, as everyone else does when you watch Dragon's Den of The Apprentice, I say everyone else, a lot of people do. Oh, what idiots are on there? I could do that. <laughs> that, that is just ridiculous, you know? So I thought the same. So, and then it was literally five very simple questions. It was like, you know, why would you be a good partner to Lord Sugar? Um, What's your, what's your strengths? Those kind of very simple things. It took less than five minutes to complete. And I did it and thought and think I was of it. And then a week later, I got an email saying, congratulations, we'd like to invite you to one of our assessment days, I think they called it. Uh, and I went to that. And then that was a long, long day of various different interviews and a screen test where they record you. And so that's where um, on YouTube, you'll find the candidate interviews. They're done after a 12-hour day. 
purposefully told that, um, you know, to get on the show, you've got to be very, very um, not controversial, but they kind of irk out of you. So you start and you just talk normal, like I'm talking to you now. And they're like, yeah, but what do you really think? And what, like, they keep prodding and prodding you to give a response. You're so tired at that point. You're like, I'll just say whatever. Like, so you start kind of then talking a bit of gibberish. And that's obviously what they catch you out on. And then, you know, they put it onto YouTube and in isolation. It looks like you're a total imbecile. <laughs> We've all seen it. We've all seen the audition tapes. But exactly. What, what was it that made you want to apply them? Was it, I, I, I've been through the audition stage as well. Um, okay. And, and I, they were speaking to people, some people were there because they really needed the investment for their business. Some people were there because they love Lord Sugar. And then some people yep. were there because they needed like, they needed the fame. They wanted the influence, you know? So what, what yes. was you in it for? Uh, none of the above, I'd say. I'd say oh, wow. um, the, the Facebook thing again was the chance thing. And I didn't even have a, a business idea that I was pursuing at that point in time. I just kind of finished turning around the family business or being a significant player in that. So it was struggling, as I said to you, because of the financial crisis and tons of other reasons. Um, so we kind of turned that around. And I was at a bit of a loss as to what to do. So I said, I just applied for it. And um, it was just, it was just like, like a monkey bar thing. It was like, I put my hand on the first one to apply, then the second one to do the interview stage, then the third one, fourth one. And that was that. And then it came to point in time, like, okay, you've got to, in fact, no, I, I tell a lie, you do have to put your business model business plan sorry that second part so after you answer yeah. those first questions that that's how they changed it now because i told them to because it's so silly oh, really? basically <laughs> well if you think about it like this right if there's for only five questions um you're not creating a big enough barrier to entry to find yeah you know, they're basically the screening process is ridiculous they invite thousands of people to apply and, and they screen them and all the rest of it and i'm like surely you should put up before that uh, a longer questionnaire because if people can't be bother filling that in then they're you know they're probably they're not, not worth it of course yeah. exactly so they so then they started doing that um it's seven pages sure. or so now yeah there i've got it go. in front of me seven sure pages i had it yeah i had a pretty big influence in because I, I remember being like this is so silly why you're you're interviewing all these people off five questions like get it a bit more fleshed out so you then can you know sort the week from the uh from the ones you want which makes sense uh, yeah it makes sense so then and then I do remember I kind of scrambled around thinking, well, what can I, my business idea be? It was like retrospective almost. Mm. Um, and I had to do it in a week or two before I had that audition. So I came up with an idea that I had implemented in the family business, which was um, there was a kind of a period of time, and, and it's still the case now, where um, high-end watches, so Rolex, Amiga, Taikoya, those sort of brands, um, you used to have to be an agent and licensed from those brands to sell the watches. Right, um, yeah. And the pre-owned or second-hand market was minor. Um, but that all changed. And I'd say the main reason is probably because of the um, trouble in the Eurozone with Spain, France, Greece, all those sort of countries, where their stock is a Rolex, for example, still had to buy a quarter million, half a million pounds worth of watches. But actually, they weren't selling them to their uh, their normal consumers because they just didn't have the money or whatever reason. So for them to keep their license, they have to find a way to sell them and start exporting them. And then they start coming to the UK. And obviously, with the um, the EU at, the, at that point in time, there was no tariffs, all the rest of it. Um, so the market was awash or starting to be. I could sense it. Um, I think that's one of my strong points, really, is sensing opportunity. So I could sense that that was happening. So I said to an investor that I knew, or a guy that I knew who had money and also loved watches, how about you give me a hundred grand, um, this before wow. The Apprentice, a few months ago, yeah. give me a hundred thousand and I'll put it into watches and I estimate I can return you X percent in the next, in next period of time. It's about 7% in a few months or something, which obviously compared to the bank was phenomenal. And yeah, he yeah. understood watches and he knew that they're an asset themselves. So worst case scenario, he's got an asset on his hands and that's fine. So then we went to the market and well, I went to the market and I bought the, uh, a number of Rolexes and a few other things. And hey, presto, we put them into my family store and they sold. The customer was getting a good deal because they couldn't get the watch elsewhere at that kind of price. He, The investor was getting a good deal because money was returned quickly with a, a nice um, interest. And the family business was getting a great uh, deal because they didn't have to finance the watches, didn't have to put the money in to, to actually, you know, because think about it like this. If you have one, Rolex watch in your window um, hmm. and the rest is just mediocre watches 
it's a bit like it, it doesn't really uh, give great confidence. But if you no, have yeah. then ten or fifteen watches, it may well be that same watch that you had previously is the one the person wants. But they want to see a, a choice and know that they've seen a reasonable, um, a reasonable offering. Which so it just worked it, exactly. It worked all the way around, and um, I thought, you know what? I wonder if we did this in a much larger scale, how this might work. So I came up with a business plan that was almost like a, a crowdfunding vehicle for watches. Um, so what it would be is something like a, a consumer might put maybe it started a hundred pound or a thousand pounds. I'm not quite sure. Um, and I'd say I can give you an 8% return over 12 months, as long as the money's fixed. Uh, and I'd be buying watches with that money and putting them into jewelers all around the country. So it's basically an extension of what I did with my family business, but into lots of other jewelers in the country. So helping jewelers finance watches, helping uh, people, everyday people, to actually make uh, a percentage return. Uh, And that was the idea. So you're clearly business savvy, or you've got the business acumen, as Lord Sugar would like to say. So how did you find applying, because you clearly, uh, like I said, you've got the business skills. How did you find applying those skills to the tv show do you think there was a sort of disconnect there or do you think you could apply them to your best of your ability sure so i think that the best way to describe the apprentice is that it's like your worst day at work and then times 10 and also film so <laughs> when things are going well they will put spanners in the works and change the parameters it's a bit like going back to my tesco days where you've done something you've achieved something to get that promotion in this case to get that you know you've done well on this task and all of a sudden um some of the goalpost moves and that item that you bought um i recall for example on my series when you go and buy that um week you go basically hunter gathering for lord sugar's you know different items yeah and one of them was a scarlet doe skin which no one knew there was what we found out was what the um the lords and, and ladies in the house of lords um wear uh, when they're kind of in the ceremonial duties whatever and we figured that out. We went to go pick up this material and we walked out with it. We got a good price and it was all quite simple. And then one of the producers goes, mm, I'm not sure that's actually Scarlet, you know. And I'm like, I mean, the guy told us it was like, <laughs> you know. So we go back in and we film this other kind of alternative piece where it wasn't Scarlet. And then they said not to use that or not to use that in the boardroom. But it's that kind of stuff where they kind of throw in little, you know, I'll give another example where um james who eventually won the series there was an episode my last episode with the dogs where we were we were um that was a tough one dog, yeah we were doing yeah. a dog spa and the other team were doing a dog kind of exercise class <laughs> and what james had done is he'd, he'd started to charge like 40 pounds for an hour of this class when normally it's seven or eight pounds and so the producers went around and told people on they were on the um program oh, you've been overcharged, you should go speak to, it was Joanna at the time, Elizabeth, go speak to Joanna Elizabeth and they'll give you a refund or whatever. Wow. That would never be, they really stir, they really stir things. And ironically, that's what ended up making them win the task because people had already in their mind spent the £40. They know why you're calling, they know what what, what they're going to be on TV and stuff. And they've already spent them in their head. So when they got that refund of £20, £30, they had that cash in their hands to go and buy auxiliary, you know, items they were selling, like, I don't know, dog leads or whatever it was. And that's what won them the task. So it's a it's an odd kind of, um, yeah, it's not as straightforward as it looks, put it that way. Yeah, it must have been so tough. But again, going back to your Tesco days as well, what what did you learn from that that process? Was it was it beneficial, do you think? Um, Overall? yeah, I think about this often when people kind of ask me these kind of questions. And I think that um, when you come off, so you, you film in May, June, and then you uh, air October. So that's a really weird period of time to start with. You're kind of in a bit of a loss what to do. Then you have um, the program airing and, you know, Twitter goes crazy. And for me, that first episode, Twitter went absolutely mad. And all of a sudden you get a sense as to what it's like to be in the public eye. And then you go out and everyone wants a picture. And I mean, everyone is, is. If you think about the numbers alone, it's something like one in 10 people watch that show in the UK. It's a lot. Which is a lot, a lot of people. Um, so anywhere you are, the chances are at least a few, few people recognise you, want a picture, whatever. And it's fun and, and people around you will enjoy it. And I remember once going to London for a friend's birthday, 
honestly, there were queues of people wanting photos and all the rest of it, which is nice. Wow. But when when it's your friend's birthday and you've come down for that, you don't you don't want this sort of you know attention almost. But I also had this feeling that you know how would I want to, I put myself in their shoes and thought, I've got to be nicer. I can't be a pain and I can't be, you know, nasty and be like, look guys, and this, this, this. So you, I did get, you know, I, I'm just bringing it a bit more to a, a different point, but this whole Caroline Flack um, situation and various other people that I've been in that space, I um, empathize with it from a different level because I've experienced it, albeit at a lot smaller level without question but also in a very much in a much more condensed format where for a few months afterwards you are in, in the spotlight all the time uh, and people are constantly kind of judging you and, you know, people come into your life at that point if you allow it to that are there for the wrong reasons, whether they think you've got money, whether they think you've got a bit of influence or fame or whatever you want to call it, um, you get you can really get surrounded by the wrong people if you're not careful. Um, and that goes back to my original point of surrounding yourself with, with the right people. I saw like straight after the show because uh, we've been following each other since since the show in 2017. Sure, um, you, you did go quiet for a few months, didn't you, on social media? Is that right? You sort of disappeared. I guess it was yeah. it because of that. I've had a, I've had a bizarre relationship with social media. So I went went through a period of time when I, di- I didn't post much, and then I went through a time where I really overshared everything, and I was trying to. Uh, it's almost a cry for help in some respects because you're looking for gratification from you know. Um, outside strangers you've never met yeah. um you you can get very lonely because uh, no one no one around you understands right no one around me had ever been on tv really and no and certainly no one has been on a show that that if they had been so no one gets it no one understands it your parents don't get it your friends around you don't get it um and the show do a really bad job of kind of explaining to you what how to handle it and all the rest of it they're, they're terrible at that um so it's, it's 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 challenging. I mean, your point was, what did I learn? So if you're going back to that, or what, how had it helped me? I think initially it doesn't. I'll be honest, unless you are like Camilla Ainsworth, who I commend highly, who's got a product raring to go and can kind of press play as soon as the their fame hits the a peak uh, yeah, and take advantage and capitalise. Yeah. Very very smart. But with mine, it's not exactly a simple thing to translate. It also wasn't a consumer. It wasn't really your your um you know average consumers type of product it was a more difficult thing um so i and i don't know i just wasn't in a place to take advantage of for whatever reason i didn't have the focus i didn't i don't know i can't really explain why and then i'd say now um for example when i reach out to people over in the states even because of obviously who their president donald trump is and was the apprentice host back in years gone by Mm -hmm. it does help a lot Um, and i think people now once that kind of they forget the kind of comedic value of the episode you're in or whatever it was. They go, actually, anyone that's got half a brain, you've gone through a whole crazy process. You clearly got something there. Um, yeah, I want to have a conversation or whatever. So um, now I think after, after the event, um, it, it works. But I think, as I say, during it, you can get caught up in this whole celebrity culture where, you know, you give you give a talk for five hundred quid here to a school, and you do this and that and other, and it's great. But is it really building your career? I, I don't think. If you look at look at the fact that there's been what there's been fifteen series, I think, and an average of twenty people in a, a, a series. So that's what we're talking three hundred people. How many of those would you recognise in the lineup now? How many of those are doing anything? worth talking about if that makes sense that's a hard harsh way to put it but you know what i mean yeah um, of course yeah only a handful there, a small small handful exactly yeah um i but, think someone from the gone current i was going to say before we um get into you mentioned what you're up to um and you're yeah. giving your giving some great opinion on the show as well um i was going to say what was your thoughts on the latest series then because you was right it, it was the 15th series last year um okay. what was your thoughts what was your thoughts on that i I'll be honest, so after the, the interesting thing is, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, is that I hadn't actually watched this show for a number of years before I applied. So I didn't oh, okay. really know what the kind of um, the vibe, for want a better phrase, was, what the kind of, um, you know, what the narrative, that's a better word, what the narrative yeah. was. Um, if I had watched it, I might have gone, you know what, this is not really series not really for me i think years ago it's it, it, for some reason had a bit more business 
savviness about it. It's had something. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it did. No, 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 I think you're right. And I think yeah. you're, you know, I remember looking in despair at the, the uh, pre launch advertisement they made for our series. And it was really tacky. It was really cringy. And I'm looking at thinking, oh my God, what have I got myself into it? <laughs> I, remember, I remember thinking that. Um, so I haven't really watched it. And I, I've watched an episode here or there. But again, because you know, I say you, because I know how it all works, it kind of ruins it to a level. Um, so I didn't really watch it, to be honest with you. And I haven't really watched it since. Um, that's my, yeah, honestly, that's that's just all I can tell you. So I don't know. I, no, um, I don't really have an opinion on anyone or anything. Because I'd say, I think you, you, it's like trying to make an opinion on someone you're just reading about in the newspaper. Like how much of what you're seeing is just edited. How much of what you're seeing is just a point of view that sort of thing. I've met, yeah, I have met Lewis Ellis though. Um, yeah. We were, we were at a similar event a few weeks back and went for lunch afterwards and he's a really lovely guy. No, that's a coincidence. Think... He's my next guest that? on the podcast. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so that's okay, a... yeah. good. Yeah, good Lewis, is a, Lewis is a really, really nice guy. Yeah. Uh, he's got his head screwed on um, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do some interesting things and what he's doing again that I didn't do, uh, he's capitalising um, with on the business community and the business opportunity of having just come off the show. Uh, yeah. Whereas for me, as I say, I wasn't in the right kind of position mentally and all the rest of it to kind of take advantage of it in, in the best possible way. That makes sense. You spoke about uh, Lewis doing interesting things. What sort of interesting things are you up to nowadays? Absolutely. So um, my focus is called Allergy. Yeah. Uh, and Allergy is an app to make eating out with dietary requirements easier. So that might be if you've got an allergy to certain food, it might be if you've got an intolerance, it might also be that you just have a diet, I call it a nuanced diet, anything from vegan, vegetarian, or anything in between. Um, and it's just a way in which I can uh, help people navigate menus when they're researching where to eat and also when they're actually at the table. So it brings you a curated, personalized menu of, say, Carluccio's, for example. Um, versus looking at the whole menu and trying to figure out what will or won't uh, work for you. Um, and it's super interesting and, and it's a simple concept. There's a, about half a billion, if not more people that suffer with food allergies around the world. And add on to that a few hundred million more who are vegetarian, vegan and all the rest of it. So it, it's, it's in the billions, the kind of potential market. Um, and the interest has been amazing. I mean, I've got interest from top executives over at Microsoft in the States. Nice. Um, I've got people from, you know, C-level people over at Costa Coffee. I've got, um, or you, you name it, I've got professors in the allergy community that are, they are world leaders. Um, and it's really interesting. And I think it's just, it just goes to show if you utilize um, something like LinkedIn smartly, um, you can really approach people that um, you maybe thought otherwise would, would not easy to get in touch with but actually what i found is if you've got a good idea and one of the things i would stress with allergy that i have done successfully is i've spoken to probably over 1300 people that i've logged in different things from you know everyone from restaurateurs to marketing to people that own magazines or everything you can think of yeah. every different variable and because i've shared the idea from a very early point and i've shared my pitch deck so if you don't know a pitch deck is effective like a powerpoint presentation of what your business is and who it's going to help and those sorts of things um it's helped me refine and iterate that pitch deck to such a level now that when i send it to really senior people they're like oh well this is a great pitch deck that's only been the case because i've sent it and i've shared it so many times that i now know what to change or if i'm in a conversation with someone very senior I can almost preempt the concerns or questions they might have prior to. So my, my, my big point here is don't keep your idea close to your chest. Um, don't kind of, um, this is my view anyway, don't do this whole, oh, sign an NDA before you talk about it. I remember years gone by, I had an idea, my brother, and I sent an NDA to kind of a, a guy that I wanted to meet. And he came back with an article saying, put it this way, if your idea is as simple as a secret source, you haven't really got a business. Um, wow. And he, and he is right because yeah. anyone can pick up allergy and go, you know what, I can do that. Of course you can. But it's about execution. It's about sales and marketing. It's about raising finance. It's about there's so many things to do um, that need to get done. But having shared my idea around, you get a better feel for is it really something that's just in your head and you think it's great? Or is it great from people that are in the industry, people that are 
not in the industry, people that are, um, you know, have these things passed to them many, many times. Um, and that's what gives you the um, momentum, like those monkey bars again, to kind of carry on. Because once you get um, interest from someone in, who's senior in coffee, coffee, you go, okay, well, how about this one and this place and this, this, this? And that kind of leads you on. So my point is to really, from the very outset, when you've got your idea a bit fleshed out, is start sharing it around to your friends, to your family, to people outside of that that are just impartial and see what the response is. See if you even get a response. That's your thing. If yeah, you're starting to get part. responses from big players, you know there's something there, whether it's exactly what you're doing now or, or something. But as I say, if I've got kind of really senior people at Microsoft interested from over the pond, um, in the concept, and this person was telling me they get three or four pictures a day and normally don't even bother responding. And I've had wow. an hour phone call and various emails with this person very, very last few weeks. And then the, recently, a very, very senior guy over at IBM is interested in all these crazy, crazy people that you're like, hold on a minute, like this is a, this is, I'm, all, I'm assembling some of the most powerful um, executives in the whole of the state, if not globally. Um, like the Avengers. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of it's a bit like that. I mean, you know, I'm just reading a book now with, and that's another thing I'd say. So, just a slight, slight off point, but one thing that I've done this year so far that's really worked well for me is I set um, a quarter goal, three quarter goals. So by the end of March, uh, one was to lose 10 kilograms, which I'm mm. pretty much on track for. Nice. One was to read five books, so one every other week, and one was to get a prototype for allergy done. And having those real simple, achievable, manageable, all the rest of it, smart objectives, you know what they are. Um, yeah. Having those in place has meant that decisions that I make day to day, the small ones, like, do I have that chocolate bar? Do I um, scroll through Instagram for an hour? Do I, uh, whatever, it really starts to uh, center you and focus you. So rather than scroll through Instagram, I will go read my book for a bit or I'll rather than watching some program on TV that's really, you know, killing time i'll think what can i do that's more useful i'm not saying that i don't you know ever uh, watch some like tv or don't ever of course <laughs> you know i'm, I'm a human and that was silly yeah. i didn't but i think it really helps to kind of focus your mind and kind of get you um yeah it's just really it's super helped me so i would suggest to people don't create year-long goal i think it's too long but i think for a 12-week period is a decent amount of time and it's also pushed me on to trying a, a vegan slash vegetarian diet on the mo most part and that's been one of the main reasons I've lost nine pounds or something like four or five kilograms in about a month or so, but very sustainably still been eating what I, pretty much what I want to a degree. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's really important for anyone, no matter if you're in business, whatever you're trying to do is set yourself some targets some goals that are, you know, smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. Um, and yeah, it sounds cliche and whatever, but it's really important, I think, to kind of keep you focused and, and in the right place. Uh, final point then you're you're definitely on track um how how far away is allergy to sort of being completed and brought to the market and then within yep. that have you got any other plans for the future or is it just sort of working on yourself and and the allergy app yeah sure so allergy is probably four weeks or so away from a beta um nice. and I'm, i want everyone to kind of look at that but and again i've um being very proactive so rather than get to the point where i've got a an app and i'm like oh who do i share this with now throughout the whole process of me talking to all these executives i've been like right well i've got this beta launching in four weeks now there's a huge pressure on that because it might not be exactly right but one book i'd recommend is called the lean starts by eric rees uh, r-i-e-s and he yeah. talks about this methodology where and this is what i believe in as well where you get things out there as quick as you can and get feedback on it rather than waiting for the perfect product and you know, looking perfect, whatever, just get something out of the, uh, out of the oven and just get people to taste it and see what happens. Uh, so that's about four or so weeks away. And hopefully you guys who are listening can have a look at it and tell me what you think. Um, in terms of your, the second part of your question, um, I'm very keen on moving out to the States. Um, I've got a lot of friends out there, friends that have done it as well. That's kind of on my agenda at some point. Um, and yeah, just really kind of seeing if allergy can be a vehicle for that to happen, really. So there's some really interesting conversations going on. I mentioned some of them before with allergy. Um, and yeah, it's taking me and getting me in front of and talking to some really, really interesting individuals. And um, that can be a great thing. It might not be a billion pound business. It might not be a million pounds. It might not work, you know, I don't know. 
but it's um it's putting me in the right place it's talking to the right people and you know like anything you just if it doesn't work out you you just get over it and you continue doing something else final question then what do you want your legacy to be if any can you think of uh, what you want your legacy to be sure uh it's very I kind of have a, a, a very simple mantra that's very, again, it's cliche, but it, it's, it's that for a reason. It's to, to help people be better. And be better is purposefully vague because your better and my better are very different things. And it's not for me to tell you what better looks like for you or for anyone else. So yeah. if I can, you know, that's why Alan is very important to me because actually it's generally going to make people's lives a lot better. Uh, who struggle eating out, who struggle kind of finding where to eat and those sorts of things. And also for the restaurants, you really, really struggle with this um, this issue. And um, I'll just really help them, help them do that. And then, you know, going on and appearing on podcasts like this, it's not just a, a marketing exercise and a kind of uh, a boasting as to what I'm doing and all the rest of it. I, I don't view that at all. My, apparent, my opinion is if one person listening to this has an opinion or changes their mind or does some action, whether they hate me, love me, don't like me, I've no, no opinion, whatever, but something I've said, one little thing resonates and just sparks a reaction, that's uh, an hour well spent for me. Um, so that's, yeah, my legacy will be, I'd love to create a global business that's like, you know, known um, all around the world, um, absolutely. I'd love to have the the resources, so whether it's money or, or otherwise, to do what I want, when I want, how I want, with who I want. And also be able to kind of give back and, and you know change the world for the better. And these are kind of I think I don't say most people want to do that, but these are very um, high level visionary things. I think the simple thing is day to day is again how can I make people better, be better, or how can I help them be better? That's the simple way of putting it. Very nice. Um, I'm sure you'll you'll smash it. You seem to be smashing it already. Um, if people want to follow your journey, where are the best places for them to go have a look? Absolutely. So. Um, all the usuals, LinkedIn, um, uh, Instagram mainly, uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, there's also a podcast that I'm doing called The Burning Desire po- uh, Show, which I might well get you on. It's about people that are making it rather than made it because I think there's a ton of podcasts all about the £100 million person that's done XYZ or the billionaire that's done whatever, but yeah. there's not that many on people that are hustling now and, and can help the people who are listening because they're a little bit further along the journey, but not too far away to be, um, you know, miles away. Yeah. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and then in terms of me personally, yeah, it's, um, I think it's Charles O'Burns on Instagram. All the rest of you will find it quite easily. And then in terms of allergy, uh, majority of the um, handles are allergy app. So it's A-L-L-E-R-G-I. And if you're interested in the product, then happily sign up to the newsletter, which is on allergy, so A-L-L-E-R-G-I again co.uk and then you know you'll find out when the uh, launch is and you can have a look and tell me what you think of it all right perfect charles it's been a pleasure thank you very much for coming on it helps me a lot and, and i'm sure my audience will find what you're saying very valuable so thank you very much thank you take care